when I was a lot younger, in my 30s, in my 20s, I used to tour in a band, particularly in my late teens, early 20s. And in the course of that, I had to go on to a trip into Darwin. I don't know if there's anyone been to Darwin. It's a very hot place. But anyway, we got up in there into Darwin. And anyway, this guy, he just said, listen, how about I help you uh, and show you some of our wildlife? So he, he, he got this boat and he said, look, this is the boat we're going to go out on. And um, he said, I want you to come out and, and just go out in this boat. But he had this tour guide with him that was so flippin' annoying. He just kept going, please keep your hands inside the boat at all times. And if he said it once, he said it like 50 times. I go, what's the matter with you, man? I've been in boats. I know what to do with my hands. It's all fine. There's no problem. No big deal. And then suddenly one of these guys turned up and I realised why he was asking us to keep our hands inside the boat. It made sense. That's a good guardrail to have there. Okay, all right. But then I remembered back earlier when I was a very young kid. And you might not even know this, but we used to have a lion safari. You remember that? Bullens? Remember that Bullens lion? Anyway, as a little fella, we went along and we would get there and listen to the guy tell us what to do. And there's that same annoying dude there, same guy going, keep your hands and feet inside the car at all times. Don't go outside. You keep staying in your car. And he said, well, he said a thousand times. They even had radios. They were telling us about it. And I'm thinking, what's the big deal? I get in and out of cars all day long. I know what it's all about. And then these fellas turned up and I realised, oh, so that's why he doesn't want us to put our hands and feet outside the car. That's a good God and that's a good boundary. Now, I know some of you don't even believe that that really happened. So I got a little 20 second clip of Bullen's Lion Park. Have a look at this. Just off the highway at Yatla, wild animals roamed Bullen's Lion Park and driving around them, Queensland families in Fords, Holdens and Valiants. Shane Halliwell remembers visiting as a child. We've had lions jump onto the bonnet of the car and you've got five kids in the back of the car screaming their heads off, going, Wah! <laughs> His lion, there was six screaming in the car, him included. It was chaotic up there. I mean, these things are out of control. They're running all over your car, everywhere. Now, sadly, they ended up shutting it down. Because one gentleman thought it would be a good idea to get out of his car and walk into a pride of lions. Let's just say that did not end well. In fact, they deemed it as a suicide. Guardrails are there to protect you. The annoying guides that are in your head are there to protect you. They are systems designed to keep vehicles and people away from straying into dangerous and off-limit areas. They're there to direct and protect. Now, the guardrail, we talked about this for a few weeks, it's in the safety zone. There's no point in putting the guardrail on the other side of the cliff. It's got to be in the safety zone so that you, you know, bump up against it and then it stops you from really messing yourself up bad. If he would have kept his hands and feet and body in the car, he wouldn't have ended up lunch. That's the deal. They're there for a reason. Now, last week, Megs asked the question, has anybody hit a guardrail? And I noticed something in the room. I was the only person that owned up to that. Apparently, I'm the only one that's ever hit a guardrail. But then I thought about it during the week. And I started to think about it scientifically and I realised that our earth is spinning at 1,609 kilometres per hour. So maybe the guardrail hit me. I'm not sure whether I hit it. It might have been the other way around because it's working a lot faster. So anyway, guardrails are on highways. They're close to cliffs. They're there to protect us. But we need guardrails in every area of our lives, in our financial side, moral side, relational side and professional side. Guardrails are really a system of behaviour that becomes a matter of conscience. It's something that's placed within your mind that becomes a system of behaviour that dings your conscience to know, you know what, this is not a good idea to get out of the car while the lions are there. It's not a good idea to drive too close to this. 
Now today, it's, there are all sorts of things. You know, some, in some places you'll drive along and you'll go across the white lines and you get those rumble strips <laughs> to wake you up and get you to come back. If you have a fancy new car, they've got sensors all over the car. It, it's dinging at you and it's banging and there's sirens going off and don't do this. And if you stray across, it'll actually jerk the wheel back out of your hand because it's like you're running into dangerous territory. So we've got to have these things within us that alert us when we're getting close to something that is dangerous. And culture, as Taylor said earlier on when he started off, does not celebrate guardrails. We much like painted lines because you can drift in and out a little bit. You know, you can just blend it along and that's okay. And then suddenly you hit something that you didn't really want to hit. So today, we're going to talk about a topic. We're going to talk about friends with benefits. I, I, heard, someone, I, I heard someone early on having a chat. To, they told me about someone having a chat to their daughter. And the daughter said, oh, Pastor Kev's not going to make everybody stands up that's had a sexy thought. And I thought, that's a darn good idea. But then I realised, everyone would be standing. How do you, we're going to talk about this topic. Like, so how, how, do you, how do you put in a guardrail to protect your marriage? If you're single, how do you put in a guardrail to protect yourself until you're married? And if you're single, how do you put in a guardrail to protect yourself from married people that aren't having a good time where they are? It's one of the most needed guardrails for us to figure out, and it's the one of the most least talked about and least celebrated. It's the romantic side. Now, there is an old word, an old word called fidelity. It's a Greek word. No, it's not. It's a Latin word. And it's a Latin word for faithful and loyal. Faithful and loyal. How do you guard your loyalty to the person that you've said you're going to be loyal to all the days of your life? So I'm going to kind of act as a guide this morning. Just a bit of a guide as we go on a journey. So please keep your hands in the boat, your feet in the vehicle, and eyes on the screen at all times. Nowhere does society do a better job of blurring everything than in this area. They will push you, society pushes you to the brink of this disaster and over the edge and they'll, once you go over there, then, then it shames you terribly. And here's the deal with it. We're all a little bit complicit in this and you've got to take a little bit of ownership in this. Now, I don't want anybody nudging anybody, go, oh, that's you for sure. <laughs> because we all get wound out about certain things, but then... We entertain ourselves with a lot of this stuff. Many of us watch Stan and Netflix and Prime and all those kind of things. And I'll guarantee you many of the shows that you're watching, that you're watching and consuming, will have extramarital affairs in them. They will have people developing different streams of sexual immorality all of the time. So in, in one sense, we're a little bit complicit. Because of the fact that we feed on this stuff throughout the week. We watch all these shows and we feel on it. And, and then, but then something strange happens. So we watch it and we binge on it and we kind of like, we consume it at an entertainment level. But then when someone actually steps across the line, we're horrified. We're mortified. How could he do that to her? But we're still watching all the, all the series. How could she do that to him? How could your sister-in-law do that? Wow. It's really weird. It's really weird. Like we can watch it and we're part of the complicit entertainment of all this that's going on. Because every book you've ever written has got it in, sexual morality in it. Otherwise you don't read the book. You know, every video's got it, every media thing. It's out there, it's everywhere. And so because we're complicit, and here's the deal, Hollywood's going to keep making it because we keep consuming it and watching it. Absolutely. So we're a bit complicit in this whole process. 
But you, every day there is a system of unfaithfulness that we live in and that we, it's a tide that we are pushing against all the time. There's a, a saying that you're going to, some of you guys are not going to like this. I used to hear it a lot when I was a kid. I particularly heard it when I got my first motorbike and, and anyway, dad got home from work and I'd been using my motocross bike in the front yard to practice starts and there was actually no front yard by the time he got home. And uh, anyway, this happened and I got in all sorts of trouble and my mum said this thing, ah, oh, boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. And then I get myself in all sorts of trouble, Oh, boys will be boys. But then this whole thing then turns across and it takes a bit of a turn on you. And there is a lady, an, a lady an author called Anne Voskamp and she's, she's pretty brutal on this. And she said, particularly when young men are growing up and then their sexuality is beginning to kick in, she says this, she says, when boys are boys, girls end up garbage. And I thought, oh, that is harsh. But she said, that's the reality of it. And we got to teach our boys better than this. When boys will be boys, girls end up being garbage. And we're a little bit complicit because how do we tell our kids and our boys not to do that when we watch it? on TV all the time and we celebrate it and we laugh about it. So we're a little bit complicit in this whole thing. This whole area of unfaithfulness is so embedded in society. It has done people so much damage that if I didn't know better, if I didn't know better, I would swear that there was something out there or someone that actually doesn't like us very much and knows that this area can damage us for life. But you see, I'm a bit of a um, glass is half full kind of guy, you know? Like I kind of like see the best and I was pondering about this during the week and I thought, is there any way of actually getting the genie back in the bottle? Could we get it back in the bottle? Could, could it, what if a church or what if a community or what if a city decided, man, we could do better on this. What if we got this right? What if we actually changed it and got this right? I'll tell you that what would be different. There'd be less poverty, There'd be fewer unwanted pregnancies, less domestic violence, fewer kids in the foster care system that we are trying to help through Love This City to engage with, fewer little boys and girls growing up in homes without a mum and without a dad. That would be the reality of it. And if we're honest, all of us know someone that's been broken in this system. Many of us are someone. Some of us have opened up our homes to raise someone. And all of this is because parents never put any guardrails in place in this area. They never had anything to ding their consciences to say, maybe there's a better way than this and keep flowing with the tide of it. So if this happens to be your first time at our church, it's great to have you with us. Because yes, you have probably picked it up by now. We're talking about sex. I was going to sing about it, but not, I don't want you to get, yeah. Perfect Sunday for you. But it's a perfect Sunday for you because nobody's talking about this. There's nobody in the world that's talking about this to help you do better at this and, not, and avoid some of the damage and some of the pain. And I'm going to be sharing some of my story, uh, being transparent, and everything I share, I've already confirmed with Anne. Anne understands where we're going on this because if I don't share it, then you're not going to understand it. Let me ask you a question. If you were God and you were going to inspire someone to write some things down to educate people about sexual sexuality, what would you put down? It would probably be a list something like this. Go for it. Just go for it, man. Just protect yourself, but go for it. Have a good time, maybe. Just have a good time. You might be a little bit on the conservative side, and maybe you'll say, well, you just wait till you're ready. Just wait till you're ready. Or I've heard people come back with and say, well, you know, you drink responsibly, responsibly, have sex responsibly. Well, that's great leadership, isn't it? What does that mean? That's what humans come up with. What does God have to say about it? What does God have to say that loves human beings incredibly so? You are so valuable to him. What did he have to say? What would he have to say about this? Well, we don't even have to, we don't even have to like guess. 
Because he did have someone write it down, a guy called Paul, who was planting churches in the Mediterranean basin. And there was a little one in Corinth that he'd been there several times and he taught them. So what we're going to read, he's actually taught them several times. But he's reinforcing it again because he knows the culture of which the people that have come out of are still living in. They're in a culture of slavery under Rome. And they get abused in this area. And then they've got the law and they've got the temple system, which is so corrupt, they get abused in this area. In fact, the temple was such a profitable exercise that they actually had alongside it temple prostitutes. Just in case you're lonely when you come to church. It's crazy. So Paul's writing because he's, he's going like, I understand I understand, I I care about you. I want you to reach your full potential in Christ. I don't want you to get aced out. I want you to, you know, eternally be secure for the kingdom. You need to hear this. And so he's trying to help them remember it because there is so much around them that is drawing them away. No different to what we have today. Nothing's changed. You look at everything that goes on within the world and in society, and even if you look at the leaders of our nations, try and find one that's not immoral in errors. It's not good. It's exactly the same. So let's dive in and let's see what Paul had to say, see what we can learn. This is the first thing he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, flee from sexual immorality. He says, flee, flee from it, run from it. What are you, serious? That's crazy thinking in this world. Flee from it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me ask you a question. Every married guy here, what do you want your wife to do if someone starts hitting on her? Just protect yourself? Enjoy yourself? Take care? Just do it. No, you want her to flee. And every wife or fiance wants their husband to flee when the secretary starts flirting with him. Why, then, so where is this from? We all want it. I mean, Ty and Beth are getting married soon. Isn't that what you want, Ty? You're getting married in a few weeks, but if someone starts getting all friendly with Beth, do you want her to say, oh, I'll just protect myself, it'll be okay, or would you like her to flee? (laughs) Wow. He hesitated. He hesitated. I'm not sure. Uh, Maybe we should pause, go back into counselling for a while. What, it's in us. Everybody that loves someone and cares about someone deeply in this area, you want them to flee. You don't want them to say, oh, well, just be careful, have a good time. No, because there's something in you, you know, you, we need to flee this. And where do we get this from? It's, all, it's in all of us. Well, this is where God says to you, flee it. Now, here's a little kicker to this. If you have to flee something, what does that mean? It's pursuing you. It's pursuing you. Sin And sexual immorality is pursuing you. And this goes right back to the garden, right in the very beginning. It says sin crouches at your door. It wants you. It's trying to get you. It's doing whatever it can. And sin produces death and that destroys relationships. And that wrecks you, that wrecks families, and it wrecks the very thing that God loves, which is humanity. Maybe we do have an enemy out there. I don't know. Just a thought. He goes on and says this, all other sins a person commits. What do you mean all other sins? So are you saying this sin is different to all other sins? Uh Uh-huh. Yep. This one is different. This one is uniquely damaging. It's possible to recover from a financial thing or a professional thing or an academic thing. But this one, this one of sexual immorality, and this is going to rattle a few cages, and I'm sorry, but you need to hear it. You can be forgiven of it, but you never fully recover from it. It lasts with you for a lifetime. It's a part of it. It's just how it is. I wish it was different. And the reason for that is because we're uniquely designed and God has a very specific plan for sexual union. And because it's all mucked up, we damage ourselves. And it resurfaces at different times in different spaces over the course of your life in different ways. See, God said the two, the two shall become one. It says two will come together, man and woman together, and the two will become one. It's a body, soul, and spirit thing taking place. You become one. And what God makes one cannot be undone. 
You can rip it apart, but it's not undone. You fracture yourself. You fracture your soul. And when you get down this path and you move into this path, here's what happens. Sexual sin will make you a liar and a secret keeper for the rest of your life. Everybody will, you can laugh and joke about, hey, I went bankrupt. No worries, yeah, that's great. I had this profession thing, I failed miserably. Man, I was so useless at school, I struggled. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I got involved with the wrong crowd. We actually robbed a bank and went to prison. Isn't this great? And you can share all that. But sexual sin, mm, nobody wants to share that. It's all hush, hush. Some of the saddest stories I've had to deal with as a pastor is when couples get married and they have not had honest conversations and dialogue. And then a few years down the track, something comes out that one partner didn't know. And this one goes, yeah, I did tell you about that. And you go, no, you didn't. Well, I, I told enough to appease my conscience. Yeah, but you didn't tell me the whole thing. And then it starts to think like, oh, wow. So what else have you been lying about? What other secrets have you got? And it starts to erode the marriage. And it starts to come apart. I say to ones now that if someone does fall into adultery or have an affair or something like that, whatever you want to call it, get it all out on the table at the same time. When you come, let's get it all out on the table. Don't hold anything back. Get all the gory details out there. Both partners need to know. And then there's opportunity for the grace of God to build you and put you back together. And, and guys do this all the time. We're tempted. I don't want to hurt my partner. So therefore, I'm only going to share this little bit. And you think by doing that, you're not hurting them. But here's the deal. If you don't get it out all on the table, I say to them, if you don't get it out now, and in two years' time, three years' time, it comes out that you lied, it's game over. There is no going back from it. It is huge. It is huge what transpires here. When I got married to my beautiful wife, Anne, I think she's on church online, um, I asked her to marry me and, and I realized I've got a history. So I had to tell her, basically, well, you know, I toured in rock and roll bands and you all know what goes with that. And I said, so I kind of had a few girls in different places bit like a sailor. Um, and I had to say to her, I'm really sorry, I'm ashamed of it, and I, you know, I, but I can't fix it, I can't change it. But you need to go and pray about this because uh, I can't guarantee you. I cannot guarantee you that one day someone's not going to lob up and go, hey, Dad, how are you? And that could be awkward. So you need to think about that before you go into this. And so uh, she did, and she took three weeks she took three weeks to respond. Why? Because she had to process this. So you, you, you've got to make sure you don't keep it as a secret because the secrets come out and, and take you down, down the track. So we can laugh about lots of things that happen to, in, uh, to us in life, but we don't laugh about this area of sexuality because it turns and it makes us a liar for life. I think it's amazing. It's a, you, I cannot get my head around it now. I mean, I, I think back and I go, what, what the heck was I thinking? Why would I give myself to someone that I hope I never see again, knowing that that is going to make me a liar for life to the one I hope to spend every day with? Doesn't make any sense. But in my defense, no one taught me anything like this. I didn't know anything about it. I thought it was just a physical thing. No one said anything about two becoming one. Who's telling you about that? This is the reason it's so powerful. It says all other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. This is not a sin that just hurts you, hurts others. This is a sin that hurts you. When I came off the road, as I said, I had, had some multiple relationships and I couldn't settle. <clears throat> I just couldn't settle. I would try to stay in one place for a few months and then it's like I'd have to go. And I kept just running all different directions and I was just going insane and this dear old saint said to me he said have you ever asked God to try and heal you or at least bring you to peace or wholeness out of the soul ties and I go what the heck are you talking about I got no idea he said you don't understand you have fractured your soul I said what do you mean he said, when the two become one and what's one cannot be undone, there is a piece of you in several cities around that you are connected. And I went, you serious? 
Yeah. And so he, he was a dear old son and he sat with me and he said, you have to go and apologize to the ones, those ladies that you can find. You have to go and ask for forgiveness. And so it was, it was a horrid journey. And then, and then I had to then say, Lord, would you please heal me to the point where I'm, I, can be, I can be whole. I can sit and I can be whole. I'm not, I'm not driven all over the place. And so it took a while. It took a, probably about a month or so of just working with that guy. And eventually I went, oh, I'm whole again and I don't have to run anymore. But I knew, even though I don't have to run, I knew I was damaged. And I knew that that, for some unknown reason, was never going to leave me. Now, we're all from different walks of life and we've heard different things about sex. We all have grown up. We've all heard it. What Christians believe is that God created sex. It's no surprise to him. He created sex, not just for procreation, he created it and it's a fascinating, it's powerful, but it's dangerous and it's fulfilling and it's fragile. And this thing called sexual union is given as a gift to mankind. Without it, none of you would be here. The species wouldn't have lasted very long without it. But it's this incredible gift. But it's the only gift that comes with rules, with boundaries, with guidelines. And he says, if you work within the rules, this gift will be the greatest blessing immeasurable to you. If you break the rules on this one, you will pay an enormous price of pain and suffering. You will damage yourselves. That's why when, don't just say to a kid, don't, don't have sex before you're married. You said that, to, they said that to me. Don't you tell me what to do. I'll go and do that, just spite you. you go, There's a reason why God says don't do it. And the rule is set all forms of sexual expression and union activity are between a man and a woman in a lifelong covenant relationship till death do us part. And the sexual union is the glue that enables that one exclusive relationship to last for a lifetime. Now, I want to get rid of the elephant in the room right now because you'll be aware our government has changed its position on this. They have a different stance on marriage and they have the right to do that because they're not just representing people to follow Christ, they're representing a whole culture. They have the right to do that. <clears throat> but what I would say is that they're not thinking about your eternal security at all. They don't give a hoot about you. As long as you pay your taxes, that's what it's all about. But us as the church, I don't know how much longer we can walk together on this because at the moment we're intrinsically tied and it might come a time when we need to pull out of that space because we can't shift our position. Now, I understand there are certain churches that are shifting their position and distorting scriptures to do that. And I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry, but I've done all the study and I can't see it. So we as an elder, we're right here. One man, one woman, exclusive relationship, covenant before God for life. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. It's our job to love and not judge. And there are ones that are in different positions and you'll see them floating around the junction and things like that. And we still love them and we're still gracious and we hold our position. We hold our position and we live with the tension. The trouble is too many church leaders say they want to get rid of the tension. You cannot get rid of the tension without compromising. So we won't compromise. So we will live with that tension, but we will be loving and we'll be gracious in how we hold it. And we will love whoever comes through our doors but we have to hold that position. It is such a powerful gift. Such, the sexual union is such a powerful gift because it's designed for you to be one person for your entire life if you choose to get married. Best way to help you understand how powerful it is is to think about a log cabin. Think about a log cabin, beautiful fire there. Oh, it's so romantic, isn't it? Oh, it's the stuff all your books are written about and all your movies and all that kind of stuff. You can, yeah, yeah, we know, you know, that kind of stuff, except for the poor old antlers in the back from several dead deer. Know, but that's, but it's this, think about that. So sex there being used in the context that is, it's beautiful. It creates this warmth. It creates this life. It fosters this environment of community. Now, what happens if a log rolls out of the fire onto the floor that's not so good that's not so good but that's to give you the picture 
Sexual union within the confines ends up like the log and the fireplace. And it's, oh, it's beautiful. You start going outside it, it'll literally burn your house down. It is so, so destructive. When it comes to sin, Jesus was very clear about what sin is. He says, anytime you hurt someone, anytime you steal from someone, anytime you dishonor someone or another person, that is a sin. He really spelled it out. So anytime it's me before you to your detriment, that's a sin. Anytime it's you before me to my detriment, that's a sin. Now the golden rule of the law was do unto others as they do unto you. Just a little bit worse. But do unto others as they do unto you. Jesus' law, the platinum law is you do unto others as God in Christ has done unto you. It's completely different. This is where... You get love your enemies, do good, care. So whenever you hurt someone else, whenever you hurt another person, you're not okay with God. Best way to help you understand this, some of you are dads. I'm not a natural dad, but I'm a spiritual dad. And here's the reality. If if you hurt one of my kids that I care about, we're not okay. We can't be okay because you're hurting someone that I love. Now, here's what you can do. You can send me money. You can sing me songs. You can praise my holy name. But we're still not okay because you're hurting ones that I love. And every single person that you lock eyes with, God loves deeply. And I need to emphasize this deeply. Even the Kiwis. I nearly didn't put that in because I couldn't, wasn't sure it was theologically correct. <laughs> God loves everybody. So when we take this gift, this gift of sexual union that has been designed within the confines of marriage between a man and a woman, covenant, exclusive before God, when you take it and then you divvy it up with a bunch of people, you fracture your soul, you hurt yourself and you hurt them. It's not what it was supposed to be. And instead of being a nice log on the fire, it's burning your house and their house down. Let's keep going. All other sins a person commits is outside the body. Whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. This is what, it affects us. Everything about it. When you sin in this area, you betray yourself. You betray your future. You compromise what might be in the future. You literally set yourself up to be a liar for life. Because you are not going to want to sit and tell your spouse the things that you've been doing prior. Why would we do it? Because society tells us that's what we should do. Now, Paul changes gears here and he goes, do you not know? Well, obviously, he thinks they don't know because he's saying, do you not know? He says, some things you need to know because if you know this, and now what Paul's doing is he's going to change gears here away from consequences of the sexual union sin to actually to identity. This is what he's going to do. He says, do you not know? Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. He shifts it away from consequences to now who we are. Now, when we see temples today, we usually see them on tourist shows and things like that. It's no big deal. It means nothing to us. To some people, they're still important. But Paul is switching this whole thing of sexual morality. He's saying, did you not know? You are the temple of God. You are the sacred image bearer of God. So is every person that you meet, a sacred image bearer of God. You have to be careful how you treat each other. Don't rob each other. Don't steal from each other. So when you take that gift that was designed for an exclusive relationship and you divvy it up, you fracture yourself, you fracture everybody else, you hurt yourself, you damage yourself. There's always forgiveness. I am a living testament to that. But as much as there's forgiveness... I can see there's still part of me that's broken. I know it's there. It's like Jacob's limp. I sometimes Anne will ask me, so what does it feel like? I said, it's like, I don't know if you've ever seen this. It's like when you clean a window and there's a mark inside the glass and you're scrubbing, scrubbing, scrubbing. You're trying desperately to get rid of this thing. It's not harming anything. It's not doing anything, but you just, it's like a little thing. It's just there that God's just left right there to say, you remember your past. 
This is what you do. You make sure you help someone else not make this same mistake. So we're designed all to be image bearers. Now, the reason the image bearer is so important is because the value of a container is determined by what's in the container. Isn't it? So my wallet, you could take my wallet (laughs) and you'd be extremely disappointed because there's nothing in there. Uh, (laughs) The only thing that's in there of any value is my driver's license and some cards. But if you said, I'm stealing your wallet, but here you can have all this junk out of it. Take the wallet then, I don't really care. Why? Because the container is not the issue. It's not the valuable thing. It's what's in the container that makes it valuable. Now here's something else about containers. And Paul goes on and says it, you are not your own. But we all think, yeah, I'm, my own. I'm my own man, I can do whatever I want. No, don't you tell me, I'm not. I am my own. Paul says, no, you're not. And you should be glad you're not because there's great benefits to it because the value of an object is determined by who owns the object. In 2014, a guitar was bought for $1,800, a Stratocaster guitar. In 2016, it sold for $45,000. Why? And some guy scribbled their name on it. It was Eric Clapton's guitar. He paid $1,800. It sold for $45,000. I wish I could get those odds somewhere. That's great. That's amazing. Why? Because it's not not the container. It's who owns the container. Who owns the container? Here's one that'll knock your socks off. In, in, 19, in 1968, a, a guitar was bought for 200 US dollars. The guy that bought it ended up becoming one of the most famous guitarists in bands. It sold in 2019 for $3.9 million. David Gilmore from Pink Floyd. And we all understand because all in all, we're just another brick in the wall. Took me ages to work out how to work that one in. So anyway, what Paul's trying to say, bud, is that you're extraordinary. We're all extraordinary. And he's saying, you're bought at a price. What price? The price of Christ. Shed blood. Going to the cross to deal with the sin that has damaged us and broken us. Enables us to come back into a relationship with God. That is a huge price to pay. And then he goes on and goes, therefore. And whatever you see, there's a therefore. You need to ask yourself, what's the therefore? That's what it's about. He said, in the light of, you know, the consequences of sexual sin outside of the parameters and your extraordinary value, this is where he, now he brings it all home. He goes, now, honour God with your bodies. <clears throat> honour God with your bodies. Um, I was 20 in the band touring and I hadn't given my life to Christ yet, but God was doing something in me. And then... Um, we were in Toowoomba and there was this girl that kept turning up every night to the shows. Every night, every night, every night. And she was about probably 16, 17 and a very pretty young lady. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, she, she took me aside at the end of one night and she said, I've been watching you for a few weeks. I said, oh, okay. She goes, well, I'm the last one of my group uh, in, of students that is not sexually active. And so she said, and I would really like it if you would be the one, my first. Now, I'm 20 years of age and in a band. And what came out of my mouth next was uh, unbelievable. I just, I just looked at her and I said, what you're offering me is not mine to take. It belongs to your future husband, You take that gift, forget about everybody else and you keep it aside for your future husband. And then she walked off and I never saw her again. And the band said, you're an idiot. (laughs) And I said, yes, I am on one hand, but I have no idea where that came from. But looking back, God was already at work honouring with our bodies. God, God was already doing something in me. And he's trying to help us understand there's a grander story behind this sexual union. There's a grander one behind it. He says, we need to honour God with our bodies and then honour the bodies of others as well. This is what this is about. 
If you're an image bearer of Christ, don't dishonour another young person's body and take something that doesn't belong to you, that belongs to that one person that he's got for them to walk in unity through life. Now I know, I know that boys will be boys. And I know you're thinking, how far is too far? But Pastor Kev, how far is too far? Well, you know, Paul even addresses that. Let's have a look at 1 Timothy 2, the 5 verses 2. He goes, treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. So, uh, we're all the young ones. So if you're not comfortable doing it with your sister, (laughs) it's a no-no. It's a no-no. That's absolute purity. And if you are comfortable doing it with your sister, we have another course for you. (laughs) That's a whole different area. (laughs) Absolute purity. Why are we always trying to go, well, well, how far far can I get to the guardrail? How far can I push it? Why would you do that and then damage yourself for life? Why wouldn't you say, no, 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 let's establish the guardrails now. I used to teach them and Ipswich just said, the the young ladies are princesses in the kingdom. And I used to get right on the guy and say, you damage a princess, you got to deal with me. And I know I'm a very jovial, nice guy, but you'll see another side that comes out. With that, because I understand this. I understand how damaging it is. I understand what's going on. So let me just, for a few more minutes, just poke a little bit more, because I know you're having such a good time in this message this morning. I can just see it all over your face. I just want you to, I want to challenge you on some things, like some of the stuff I'm going to say now, you go, oh, you're just old and boring or whatever. And maybe I am, maybe I've got too old, I don't know. But at, at least I want you to think about this thing, because there is so much hanging on it, so much hanging on it. If you're going to flee sexual immorality, you're going to have to have guardrails. And here's the kicker. You are going to have to talk about it. You're going to have to establish this in your marriage. And maybe you've never even had this conversation yet. Or if you're engaged or if you're dating or you're single, you've got to talk talk about this. What behavior is off limits? Well, I'm pretty, you know, just women as sisters, absolute purity. There's a good guideline right there. You know, there's one right there. You've got to decide together what are the guardrails going to be that's going to ding your conscience. Because the goal is not, the goal is not just to stay out of trouble. The goal is to actually honour one another's bodies as temples of God. You've got to avoid travelling or eating alone with problematic people. Now I know you're thinking... Who are the problematic people? You're smart. You know who the problematic person is right now. The problematic person is if you work in a bunch of offices and there's like 20 of you in there and you can get to your desk like that, but you go all the way around here and around there because there's someone that you want to see, there's someone that you want to talk to, someone makes you feel good, lights you up a little bit. Problematic person. You know who they are. And you've got to have these things in place. See, when it comes to predicting your fidelity, there is no help out there in the world. There is nothing. You're going to have to predict it. You're going to have to put these guardrails in. You've got to establish these things. Here's another thing I want to put in there. You have to tell them about it. You have to tell them. Um, okay uh, <laughs> when Anne and I got married as I said to you and this is really help you guys l- please listen to me I'm not sharing this I don't even want to share it but I need to share it um, when I came off the road as I said I'd had multiple relationships Anne had had no, no other man bar me uh, so she had no, no comparisons in here once we engaged and got married and then once we engaged sexually, things started to go very wrong for me. And I started to kind of withdraw and, and she said, what is going on? And I was trying to hide it and I was trying to just deal with this thing in myself and, and I couldn't get through it. And then and I had to say to her, honey, you know I love you. 
She goes, yeah, I know you love me. I said, I need to tell you something that you're not going to like. <clears throat> and I said, when we engage sexually, there's more than two of us in the bed. All those women come back into the equation. And I said, I'm literally going insane. And she was so gracious. And she just, she started praying for me and I'd get some counselling to help me through some of these things and deal with some of these fractures that were going on. But this is the damage, what I say to you, that happens. You can be forgiven of it. Absolutely no problem. But you damage yourself in this one because of the way that we're created, the way God designed it, you don't actually fully recover. And I don't want you to go through the same things. It was hard. It was, it was horrible to have to even say that to her. But the, I knew that if I didn't, it wasn't gonna, I wasn't going to make it because it was just too much going on in me. And so I had to get it out there. You have to be honest. You have to talk about these things. If you're starting to feel yourself be drawn to someone else, let them know you're feeling like that so they can pray with you, so they can hold you accountable. Because your heart can drift. Pastor Wayne used to say to me, my mentor, he said, he said, he said, when you come under stress in ministry, everybody else's wife looks better than yours. And I, I laughed at him when he told me and I thought, you know what, you're right. Not because they're any more pretty or anything like that, but because they represent something outside of the tension that I'm in. That's the reason why people have affairs. It's like, I want to get out of this thing that I'm in. So therefore we think it's out there and then we lure out past the guardrails and the enemy gets us. And he gets us. So you've got to talk about it. You have to talk about it. You've got to be honest with yourself. If you've got something going on at work, because it can happen at work as well, there are these places, talk to someone. Tell the boss, man, I'm struggling in this area. I mean, you know, I'm married. I've got a great wife, but this is going on. Or it could be the other way around. I've got a great husband. But... Could you just relocate me somewhere? And you're going to have to do some things. You're going to have to put some things in there to just protect yourself. And you've got to protect yourself from social media. It is just a gamut out there that you can get in trouble. And unfortunately, people, this is going to surprise you. You probably don't know this. They lie to you. They lie to you on social media. Come on. They actually lie. They tell you they're like this, this, this. And they go, whoa, you don't look nothing like that. I did when I was young. Come on, you didn't look anything like that when you were young. So guard yourself from this. On, the, on social media, it's fantasy. It's all romanticized. It's all out there and it's all a big fat lie. So just watch yourself. You, you're the one that's going to have to protect yourself. Here's the deal. You put these guardrails in place in five years time from now, I'm telling you, you will celebrate the fact that you have protected yourself and you've honoured other people. You get it wrong, you end up living with regret for the rest of your life. And the romance in marriage is all fueled by a sense of exclusivity. When someone knows that you're the only one for me, I only have eyes for you and I only have eyes. <laughs> Thanks, Tom, for you. We're going to be faced with something every day. You're going to decide whether you, when this happens to you, because it will happen, you're either going to flee or you're going to flirt. Flee or flirt. You're going to have to put some guardrails in place. But if you flee, you honour God, you honour yourself, you honour your kids, you honour your future kids, you honour other people around you, that brings blessing. So out of this area here, most of all, I just want to hope that you'll go away and think about it. Just think about what's going on. Talk about it. Think about it. Do something about it. Make it, I'm forever yours, faithfully, till death do us part. Remember that part, till death do us part? Listen, imagine being able to say, some of you younger ones, it's too late for someone like me, um, be able to say, you know, like, I have been waiting and keeping myself in Christ for you to turn up. And here is my gift to you. And this is not just for the girls. This is for the guys as well. Because when you do that, you, you start your relationship off your marriage on such a different thing, such a different footing. You know, if we could just get this one thing right, if we could just change this one thing in our nation, get the genie back in the bottle and get people to understand what God thinks about this, there'd be less poverty. There'd be less unwanted pregnancies, less domestic violence, fewer kids in the foster system, fewer little boys and girls growing up 
Man, I bump into them all the time around the place. Just mum struggling with kids and, and they're longing for dad to be around. And, and there'd be a lot less soul destroying for us to manage and a lot less suffering. Everybody carries the image of God. And we should honour our bodies by honouring other people. I'm telling you right now, you will never regret. You will never regret keeping yourself for that one kingdom life partner God has in store for you. You will never, ever regret it. If only we got this right. Who knows, maybe, I don't know. Maybe God could do it through us. Maybe we could model to a city. You know, for what faithfulness and loyalty and fidelity is all about. Maybe we can model for them, you know, like this is such a precious gift. It's not to be displayed everywhere and destroy everyone. It's for that one select exclusive person that you decide you're going to spend the rest of your life with. And the, and the sexual union is the power, is the glue that holds that relationship for a lifetime. It's actually till death that was part. I think we have a spiritual enemy and he's done a really good job of damaging a whole bunch of people. But we refuse to stay down. Those of us that are damaged and those of us that have been forgiven but still carry a limb, we refuse to stay there and we refuse to remain silent because people need to hear what they need to hear so they can protect themselves. So down the track, if you choose not to listen to what I've had to say, God will remind you of this time down the track and you go, oh, I wish I would have listened. I wish I would have applied it. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you that, uh, Lord, you're teaching us. You're teaching us how to love you and how to love one another and help us to honour our bodies and honour the bodies of those around us and, and, and realise that we are precious temples that contain your very image and help us to put some guardrails in place. Everyone's going to have different ones to flee uh, sexual immorality as it hurts those and it hurts those that, we're connecting with and it hurts ourselves and basically compromises our future and help us to stay, help us to stay the course for that one person you've, you've decided for us to walk with for a lifetime and, and then it becomes the glue that holds us together for a lifetime. And well, this is one discipline and guardrail that will pay huge benefits. Uh, help us to remember that why would we give ourselves, our bodies to someone that we hope we never see again? And then set ourselves up to have to lie to the very person we want to see every day of our lives and keep a secret. And for those of us, Lord, that are damaged in this area, help us to experience greater depths of your grace and greater depths of your forgiveness and greater depths of your love. And and help us to be okay with understanding there's just going to be a little smudge in our window because we have damaged ourselves. And even though some of us did it in rebellion and some of us did it in ignorance, Uh, unfortunately, the law of sowing and reaping, that's just what it is. So, Lord, help us to elevate sexual union as the special gift that it is, the unique gift that it is, to help a relationship last a lifetime till death that was part. Jesus, help us to put in these guardrails. Amen.